this image of Elnor uh, speaks to me in a number of ways. I, I think about uh, where their, their family were from originally before they were uh, relocated onto the reservation uh, in the area of the Eniat River, which is north of Wenatchee. Uh, the Eniat and Wenatchee, we were very close linguistically, uh, culturally to each other. And uh, they both are parts of major tributaries, uh, rivers uh, into the Columbia River. And it's that part that I think about uh, historically, uh, what these rivers that were ultimately a part of the Columbia uh, particularly here uh, in the kind of this part of the, the great watershed of the Columbia River uh, in the Columbia Basin, uh, east of the Cascade Range. It was this world that connected all these people. Uh, where they varied tremendously at times in language and landscape, uh, from mountainous to arid to uh, all these different kind of topographies uh, of, of this area from all the way north up into Canada, to south into uh, almost Nevada, you know, and east to Wyoming, these areas where these rivers, it connected all these people and that, that kind of terminology, the, what we have, the kind of follow the river as really kind of the, the, the basic introduction to this exhibit, I think is so significant, is, is uh, telling, because it was the rivers that connected these people for thousands of years. They were following the rivers, uh, not on horseback, as uh, we would want to believe, you know, through our image of Native Americans. Uh, but uh, it was, they were river people. And it wasn't just by transportation, uh, it was the food source. And one of the most important cultural kind of identities of the people of the plateau is their relationship to the salmon. As much as I, I just think this is such a phenomenal kind of painting and its depiction of what we really care about and how we present ourselves, I also think of who the families are and where they came from and what, what mattered to them and what was a big part of what they believed in. For the longest time, the tribes of the, the plateau what they used to call the intermountain region of people was kind of defined maybe more in the context of a hybrid between the two uh, and not truly as their own unique, sustained people culture. Over time, they've, people have come to realize that's exactly uh, what they were. As a matter of fact, uh, a very old, ancient, people that have been here for as long as any people uh, have been here in the Americas. Not too far from here. Uh, in the last two years, they have revealed a site on the Salmon River, a tributary of the Snake. It's been carbon dated to 16,500 years. Now they, I think, are pretty certain that this Columbia River that we are talking about and its tri tributaries that went to all these different places became the highway that they were able to come down the Pacific coast, took a left, you know, into the Columbia River and made their way up and all the way to the Snake River, all the way to the Salmon River and were already had, you know, uh, places that they were living that long ago. And I think the people of this region would tell you they knew that. I remember going back when I grew up in this area and uh, was going to college in the Pacific Northwest. And some of my you know, fellow students at some point would ask me, uh, you know, where I was from, you know, who my family was, and at some point I would kind of acknowledge my Native American background and uh, which reservation, and my family's from the Coeur d'Alene and Colville Indian reservations. And I remember my peers at some point would say, oh, that's so 
wonderful. You know, you know who your family is. Uh, you know where you're from. And uh, that's just great. And, I, and I, at the time, I just, I didn't realize that some people didn't have that. You know, maybe they knew their grandparents. Uh, they didn't really know their cousins. They didn't know much further back than that. And uh, where I grew up uh, with my mother's family, that's, that's what we knew that was very important uh, from where we came from and that, that uh, we not only knew our family, but we knew our history. Uh, we knew who we were related to. Uh, we had big families. And that was something that I kind of maybe took for granted. Uh, that that was something that people had and they they didn't and sometimes the truth is uh, that's all some of the people had was just their family uh, on the reservations uh, they didn't have much else but that being together mattered and I think you know in some ways I I look at this painting by Worth Griffin of Tespaloose Kamayakin and I think of that place this place, uh, the Palouse, right here, the homelands of uh, the Nez Perce and Palouse people. And for her and her family, her descendants, the people that came before her, how important this place was and still is to them. And so this, this sense of, uh, you know, this, this kind of paintings here in Pullman that speak uh, not just to the people that were painted at Nespelem, uh, where the Palouse people ended up on the Colville Indian Reservation, but uh, how that still is connected to this place where we are. And uh, I, I find that very important. And I, I think that uh, it's something that we, as an institution here at WSU, that we find important. Thank you for sharing that quote. And it's uh, from the Native Governance Center. And it, it really speaks to kind of this importance of land acknowledgements that are very common now, uh, and rightly so. Uh, particularly here at WSU or other land grant uh, institutions that have a history of, of being a part of these regions. Uh, beyond their borders of just where the university is actually located. And um, so with that, this, this has a significant amount of meaning for us here at WSU because it speaks to uh, the, the, the land that we share uh, with people that have been a part of this place and have a knowledge of this place, an understanding of this place that, that goes back you know, generations untold. And, and to be able to maybe have an opportunity to provide that to our students, our peers, our staff, uh, our community uh, here, I, I think is important because it's maybe not something that, that we used to do, uh, but as she stated here in, in the quotation you provided, I think quite succinctly, uh, it's something that, that we all know. Uh, we all kind of know and think about a place, something that matters to us. Uh, we all have, uh, whether it's the place that we reside now, or it's a place that we have and that, that carries meaning to us or that we go to, uh, that gives us power, that gives us a sense of, of being, a, a sense of center. And uh, I think then we can really understand uh, what, what that must mean uh, to the indigenous people whose whole kind of culture and history are connected to a particular place.
these were probably, you know, materials that he was wearing, uh, you know, at the Nespelum powwow, Fourth of July powwow, and you know, with that in mind, uh, when I had met Joe, he was an uh, elderly man, and but at this time he was young and he was a dancer, and so we think of these materials uh, that he was wearing this this roach on his head made with uh, porcupine quills and uh, deer hair that were uh, dyed uh, with a feather, kind of a little bustle at the top. Uh, and then uh, the beaded vest, uh, buckskin vest, and you can tell it also kind of had probably floral beadwork and a feather bustle uh, that uh, they would wear. And it wasn't uh, just kind of what they wore as kind of an accessory or something. These were very important items and, and they, you know, they had meaning to them. You know, the idea we would say, I talk with my students about uh, being, uh, the Native people being endor adorned in the proper relationship uh, with the spirits of, of the land that we talked about, of, of the animals. And, uh, and these uh, spirits that came to Native Americans in their dreams and in their visions uh, that told them how they could survive, how to live, how they could be human beings. And uh, this mattered uh, to the Native people. And they, they carried themselves not only in how they wore these materials, uh, how they created these materials as they're putting them together and they're thinking about that relationship and they're wanting to do it properly. They're wanting to do it with honor and respect. So for native people, they would see and understand these. And that's just the, the item. And then when they would start to dance, and that brings another level of, of that into how they moved, to how they danced, what the expectations were and, and honoring and representing uh, those kind of animals and spirits. And, uh, I think it must have been something uh, when Joe was a younger man and when he, I would love to have seen, you know, him dancing. Because uh, if you've ever been to a powwow, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, it's, it's a fabulous uh, thing to be a part of when we were selecting them. What might, what materials might Worth Griffin, Clifford Still and others had seen at that time when they were there on uh, the Colville Indian Reservation in Espelum? Uh, during the 4th of July powwow. What, what would be some of the things that they might have seen? Uh, so typically, uh, there were very few images at that time that uh, were taken, and if they were, they were in black and white. So we're really relying on Worth Griffin and Clifford Steele's images that are in color to tell us what, what some of these items might have looked like. So we thought, let's actually try to locate similar materials. This painting really touched a nerve uh, with some of the students. And it addresses, I think, where students are at now. Uh, we are very concerned about taking a critical view of, of who we were as institutions, who we are and where we want to be. And to be able to, in some ways, see where we want to go is to take a critical kind of inventory, so to say, of, of who we were prior. And uh, the term, of course, decolonizing museums is a part of that. 
but I, I think when I look at this one also in hearing uh, Jamie Durham's uh, quotation that uh, you read makes me think about the first time I saw these series of paintings myself as a graduate student. Uh, I had come here to WSU in 1991. And that summer prior to starting my graduate program here in fine arts, uh, a series of these paintings were on display in the museum. And I walk in and I never knew they existed. I look at them and I actually looked at them and realized that I knew some of these people that were painted. But what I come to realize and remember now, maybe more so now than then, was how much had changed from 1936 until at that point, 19, you know, 90, 91. I think where my graduate students, you know, are today, what they're thinking about as they look and can analyze something and, and see these legacies of, of certain ways of thinking, of working with others that they absolutely hope discontinue. Uh, it's, it's very right to see that. For me, these paintings come with that history of transformation and some of it is, is from difficult times. Uh, things that we today, I hope, uh, consider quite uh, differently. I think that uh, Worth Griffin series is just starting to come to light as it's being connected quite closely with an Espelum art colony and in particular Clifford Steele's early work. Uh, I think uh, they speak to the different eras that they were in uh, quite remarkably. And uh, there's quite a lot of room for interpretation and in all of them, uh, but I think we can find that thread of a culture that was looking at someone else and other group of people with this kind of sensibility of demise, of uh, they will either assimilate or disappear. And that was in some ways hardwired into their kind of worldview and their belief as everything that they saw uh, led them to believe that was gonna be uh, what would happen to the indigenous people. Uh, and it didn't. Uh, and thank heavens for that. And all the elders, the people that we saw prior, that did everything in their power uh, to uphold their cultural rights, their spiritual rights, their political rights, and passed that same mission on to their children and grandchildren uh, to what was important to them. And that has happened. And uh, I'm very proud uh, of my elders, my ancestors that worked hard in that capacity to, to provide for myself and my children and others. And at the same time, to hopefully make important to all people that are part of this this place that we live and uh, what, what exists here and, uh, and always has. And uh, maybe those things will touch our patrons a bit. And uh, through this uh, exhibition and this series of work, uh, they might think a little more deeply about these things. And uh, I hope that we're able to offer that for them. Thank you.